<laughs> the wind, it is blowing. The world of the Wind Waker is lonely. As you sail the great sea, exploring the many islands scattered across it, you can't help but feel how disconnected the parts of this world are from one another. The most common inhabitants of this world are monsters, selfish creatures that attack you on sight and show no sign of any greater intelligence. There are secrets to be found across this world, hidden caverns for you to explore, and treasures spread across the sea. But the one thing this world lacks the most of is people. It's not completely desolate. Windfall Island is a bustling community, filled with tradesmen, visiting sailors, and a fair share of lively characters. An outset, Dragon Roost, and the Forest Haven all have smaller, tight-knit communities, bound together by local tradition and a shared history. But even Windfall, the largest of these communities, is small. There are maybe 20 people on Windfall Island in total, if you count the sailors and the children, and only a few of these people have ever dared to travel outside of their island, or make a connection with someone across the sea. Dragon Roost, the home of the Rito, is much more tightly knit, thanks to their strong cultural identity, but despite many of its people traveling across the world as postmen, they never seem to forge any strong ties outside their community, simply passing through the islands, even as they provide a vital service for connecting these scattered people to one another. A world this desolate and lonely is not new to Zelda, necessarily. The original Legend of Zelda's world was just as, if not more desolate than Wind Waker's, and one of Ocarina of Time's most iconic moments is emerging from the Temple of Time as adult Link, only to find Hyrule Castletown brought to complete and total ruin. Past Zelda games always contextualize this loneliness, though. Even the original Zelda, with its bare-bones in-game story, made it clear in the game's manual that the people of the world were hiding from Ganon's onslaught, and would return once he was defeated and the world made safe. The Wind Waker introduces this desolate world as its status quo, however. While the game funnels you through the extended family of Outset, the bustle of Windfall, the tradition of Dragon Roost, and the charm of Forest Haven in an attempt to disguise the emptiness of the world, once you are free to set sail on the wide ocean, it becomes clear that you have seen the only bastions of civilization in this world, and that each and every one of them are struggling for survival. And then, you learn the truth. The world of the Wind Waker was founded in the post-apocalypse. The legend told at the beginning of the game about the return of a great evil, and the failure of a hero to arrive. It all happened, and it happened so long ago that no one can even remember that they are the descendants of this fallen kingdom. The people prayed for an end to this great evil, and were met with a torrential downfall with only a handful of survivors chosen to live atop the mountains and start society anew. Do you sleep still? Wait. Do not be so hasty, boy. I can see this girl's dreams. Oceans. 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 Oceans as far as the eye can see. They are vast seas. None can swim across them. They yield no fish to catch. What did the king of Hyrule say? That the gods sealed Hyrule away? And they left behind people who would one day awaken Hyrule? How ridiculous. So many pathetic creatures scattered across a handful of islands drifting on this sea like fallen leaves on a forgotten pool. What can they possibly hope to achieve? Don't you see? All of you! Your gods destroyed you! Ganondorf's motivation in this game is explicitly tied to the indifference of the gods towards the people of the world. He rages against their deluvian solution and hates the world they left behind in their carelessness. He sees the destruction they've wrought upon this world, and ties it directly to the same careless indifference towards him and his people he experienced as a child, critiquing the injustice they've committed in the name of saving a people who are now more scattered and lost than ever before. 
and Ganondorf's critique of the gods here? It's right. The complete and utter destruction of Hyrule would be a cruel and unusual punishment if it was done to cleanse the world of an evil populace, and as a means to save its people, it is a sick and cruel joke. But Ganondorf forgets that he is the reason the gods had to flood the world in the first place. My country lay within a vast desert. When the sun rose into the sky, a burning wind punished my lands, searing the world. And when the moon climbed into the dark of night, a frigid gale pierced our homes. No matter when it came, the wind carried the same thing, death. But the winds that blew across the green fields of Hyrule brought something other than suffering and ruin. I coveted that wind, I suppose. Ganondorf is at his most sympathetic in The Wind Waker. In these final scenes, we see the picture of a man driven by envy and jealousy. Envy and jealousy of a land where the forces of nature work together to bring life into the world. Life that he and his people could only hope to have. This moment of honesty reveals that Ganon is fighting, not for any sort of megalomaniacal control of the world, but for a chance to reclaim the life that fate stripped away from him fighting against an unjust world where he can be born into a society plagued with death and destruction, through no fault of his own. But, in that long process of trying to fight for a more just world, Ganondorf lost himself. In trying to take Hyrule's life by force, in using the tools of war and conquest to try and take peace, he became a force far more dangerous than the destruction of the gods, which we see from the legends of Hyrule and his destruction of Great Fish Isle. In a way, despite Ganondorf's desire to rebel against destiny, he ends up fighting to enforce it, as long as that destiny ends with him as the ruler of all life. Ganon's destructive rebellion is a direct contrast to Wind Waker's Link, whose story is defined by building community and connection across the islands of the Great Sea, seeking to unite them with each other through the bonds of friendship. As Link travels throughout the world, he makes connections with others and helps solve their problems simply by being there and being willing to do the right thing. Link sees the disconnection of the islands and works to change that from within, helping to further vitalize Windfall's economy by forming trade agreements with merchants around the world, inspiring Prince Komali to believe in himself on Dragon Roost, assisting the Koroks in spreading trees across the islands of the sea, and even helping to fulfill the lifelong dream of Orca, his mentor on Outset. Link sees the desolation of the world, and is inspired to help build something better, to fight against fate not with violence, but with compassion, goodness, and community, something truly courageous in the face of a world as lonely as his. Link's journey is also centered around two more themes, both of which are in direct contrast to Ganondorf's ideals as well. The first is in how Link in this game has no connection to destiny, or any predetermined fate at all. Only in the loosest meta sense is Link ever destined to become a hero. He begins the game as a regular boy on outset, celebrating his 13th birthday, which just so happens to mean he's expected to don the traditional hero's clothes. Beyond that though, Link's journey to become a hero is defined entirely by his own decisions. He chooses to venture into outset's woods to rescue Tetra, he chooses to leave home when his sister Errol is kidnapped and he chooses to continue down the path of the hero as a means to save his sister. And when the journey to save his sister involves him in a greater battle for the fate of the world, he chooses to continue fighting for the world even after his sister is saved. This, in tandem with the legends of Hyrule's destruction, where no fated hero arrived, have a pretty clear message. There are no destined heroes in the world of the Wind Waker. There are only people who, when the opportunity arises, choose to stand up and do the right thing, no matter the cost, and in the process of standing up for good, they become heroes in their own right. Even the pirate Tetra, who turns out to be the Princess Zelda, is heroic long before she realizes her heritage, and while her personality briefly becomes demure just after her transformation, the next time we see her, she's joining in the battle against Ganon, helping Link and becoming the key to their eventual victory. The other theme of Link's journey is atoning for the sins of the past and bringing peace to those harmed by its legacy. This is primarily explored in the second half of the game, 
where Link must travel to the Earth and Wind Temples and bring the descendants of their sages there to pray for divine power to be returned to the Master Sword. Ganondorf's destruction and the trauma and regret of the ancient sages born out of this destruction fuels Link's quest here to right those past wrongs and bring peace back to these holy grounds by destroying the evil within. These temples also tie back into Link's strength of connection with the people of this world, as both Sage's descendants are people Link has forged a connection to during his journey, and Medley in particular connects back to the theme of ordinary heroism, as it was her and Link's combined efforts to scale Dragonroost Mountain that helped calm the great dragon Valu. Atoning for the sins of the past is most clearly expressed through the King of Hyrule's character arc, though. As the King of Red Lions, he sailed across the world for centuries, searching for Princess Zelda and the reincarnation of the hero, hoping to eventually restore Hyrule to its former glory. Like Ganondorf, rather than seeing the state of the world and trying to build something good in spite of it, he saw the lonely seas, its empty oceans, and quiet islands, and sought to return the world to his status quo. He wanted to resurrect his dead world, instead of focusing on the world still living, and only through observing Link and following him on his journey did he eventually realize that his world was gone, and that the future lay with Link, Tetra, and all the scattered people of the world, to build something new and completely their own. My children, listen to me. I have lived regretting the past, and I have faced those regrets. If only I could do things over again. Not a day of my life has gone by without my thoughts turning to my kingdom of old. I have lived bound to Hyrule. In that sense, I was the same as Ganondorf. But you... I want you to live for the future. There may be nothing left for you, but despite that, you must look forward and walk a path of hope trusting that it will sustain you when darkness comes. Farewell. This is the only world that your ancestors were able to leave you. Please, forgive us. Wait. You could... you could come with us. Yes, of course, we have a ship. We can find it. We will find it. The land that will be the next Hyrule. So... Ah, but child, that land will not be Hyrule. It will be your land. I have scattered the seeds of the future. The King of Hyrule gives up any hope of restoring his own world. He accepts the death of his kingdom and the end of his own life, but not the end of life itself. He entrusts Link and Tetra to build a new world, to create a peaceful world for future generations. And in the end, we know his trust was not misplaced. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, comment, and if you want to see more videos like this and help me make content, I have a Patreon. You are seeing the names of these lovely patrons scroll up. And in addition to Patreon, if you don't want to do a monthly contribution, I have a paypal.me link as well. It will be in the description and on the screen, and you are more than welcome to give a one-time donation there to help me continue to be able to make content like this. Because I love doing this, and I would love for this to become a viable career financially. 
I'm recording this bit a little bit late, but I also want to give a huge shout out to uh, Ripley Violet Storm, who provided the voice of Ganondorf. I also want to thank Max Mariner for providing the voice of the King of Hyrule. And I would also like to thank Maruchan for providing the voice of Zelda. Thank you so much to all three of you. Uh, there are links in the description to their Twitters, YouTubes, can follow them and keep up with their work there. This video essay would not have turned out the way that it did without their help. So thank you all very, very much. Anyway, once again, thank you so much for watching. And to everyone out there watching this video, I love you. I really do. Have a good day.